Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our Science Speaker Series featuring Dr. Adam Lark of Hamilton College. I'm Janelle Gurley, Director of Science and Programs at Mariah Mitchell Association, and it is such an honor to welcome Dr. Lark this evening for his presentation on exoplanets, where, where they are and how you can help find them. Dr. Adam Lark is an Associate Professor at so rather of instruction in the physics department at Hamilton College and the director of the Peters Observatory. He earned his doctorate at the University of Toledo, researching discovery-based learning in physics laboratories and globular clusters detection techniques. Using the modest telescope at the Peters Observatory, Lark aids in the search for exoplanets through NASA's TESS follow-up exoplanet observation program. We would like to also thank Bank of America, our lead sponsor, for making this Science Speaker Series program complimentary and accessible to all viewers this evening, as well as our alternate sponsor, Cisco Brewers of Nantucket and the White Elephant Hotels and Resorts of Nantucket and Palm Beach. Without further ado, it is such an honor and a pleasure to welcome Dr. Lark this evening, and I will turn our presentation over to you, Dr. Lark. Welcome. Uh, thank you, Janelle. Welcome. I, I'm Adam Lark. As Janelle was saying, I am the uh, uh, director of the Peters Observatory and an astronomer here at Hamilton College. And I'm here to talk to you about, well, exoplanets, uh, where, you, where they are and how you can find them. Um, and uh, an exoplanet is a planet that is orbiting around another star. And at our observatory, we, uh, we search for these exoplanets. We're part of a, a NASA-led mission, I'm sorry, an, an MIT-led mission, that was kind of a NASA mission, uh, to be a ground-based observatory for a space telescope that is uh, trying to find and observe these exoplanets. Before we get talking about that, though, I want to talk about the size and scale of our solar system, something we know near and dear. Um, most models of solar systems, here's an example of one that I found in Erie, Pennsylvania. Uh, most models of solar systems have the sun, of course, at the center, and all of the planets orbiting around the sun at the center. But they do a pretty bad job of capturing the size and scale of an actual solar system. In fact, in fact they're not very good at holding together either. <laughs> but anyhow, um, uh, it's almost impossible to get the size and scale of a solar system down correctly. It's something that gets easy to talk about, but it's hard to depict. So um, I'd like to try to depict this for you today by starting by shrinking the sun down to the size of about a one billionth of the actual size of, a, of the sun. And if that's the case, then the sun's actually going to be about as tall as I am, um, or uh, six feet, maybe about the size of uh, this giant beach ball, for example. <laughs> and uh, if that's the case, then everything else should scale down alongside of it. So I want you to think about it briefly. How big would the Earth be if the sun is the size of this beach ball? If you believe my model, you might say to yourself, well, it might be the size of a basketball. Believe it or not, that's way too big. But what about the size of a softball? The size of a baseball, maybe. Still too big. Let's get it absurdly small. Let's do a ping pong ball. Look at this compared to the size of our sun. Still too big. The size of the Earth on this scale is the size of this marble. It's about half an inch. Look at this. This is everyone and everything, this tiny little marble next to this giant beach ball. This is our Earth compared to the sun. Other uh, things of interest. The softball is vaguely representative of Jupiter, the biggest planet in the solar system. It's a little bigger, of seven inches or so. And uh, Mercury would be about the size of this tiny little pea of a, a little styrofoam ball. It's, it's tiny compared to all the other planets. It's the smallest planet, it makes sense. What about this? How far away are the planets from the sun on this scale? Let's start with Mercury. Mercury is the closest planet. So we should be able to depict it reasonably, right? So let's say, do you think it's right about here, maybe, this distance away? Most diagrams and textbooks would have you believing that. It actually goes a little further. So let's walk with me across the room. This far, do you think? Still longer. 
journeyed with me to the end of the classroom. And uh, I kind of get stuck here because I need to actually go about twice this distance, about 70 feet, before I could possibly show you where Mercury was in this solar system. And it gets worse. For example, uh, Earth, our uh, marble, is actually about two football fields that way, about 600 feet, and extensively far away. Our Jupiter, we're talking about half a mile now away. My point in telling you all this is that uh, space is quite empty, as it turns out. Uh, things are much smaller and further away than we could ever depict in a, a, a model or a diagram. Uh, in every picture and every textbook is wrong. They, you just cannot capture the size and scale of a solar system in a single picture. Space is mostly empty. What about a, a nearby star? Let's talk about TRAPPIST-1. TRAPPIST-1 is about 40 light years away. It's a nearby star uh, to, to our sun. How far away do you think that would be on our one in a billion scale? Well, uh, I'm not going to walk it because that would be uh, too far of a walk. In fact, I'd have to walk about 30,000 miles that way to get to about the moon. <laughs> If I can get to the moon, then I'm about as far away as that sun is from our solar system. So why is this important? Why am I telling you about this? Well, as it turns out, every single star that you see in the sky is uh, a sun of a different solar system. Uh, in fact, the next time that you look up in the sky, I want you to find a star, and I want you to imagine all of the different planets that could be circling around that star. And all the myriad of possible configurations of these planets, what could be out there? When I look up at the sky, that's what I think about. Not the stars, but all the planets that are hiding out there. I, I find it to be incredible and awe-inspiring. And this is why I took this, uh, this task to search for exoplanets. So if we were going to try to find those planets, it would be, well, on our scale, it would be like trying to hang out on Earth and watch a giant beach ball on the moon. Actually, worse than that, because we'd have to be looking for the tiny marble that was buzzing around our giant beach ball. But we're looking at it from, from the Earth looking at the moon. Another way I've heard this described is trying to watch a fly buzz around uh, a lighthouse from a great distance away. It, it would seem nearly impossible to be able to find these planets. Uh, but clever astronomers have figured out amazing and indirect ways that they can measure and discover these exoplanets. Um, it starts by understanding how a planet and a sun revolve around each other. Um, and yes, I, I said that correctly. The planets don't orbit around the sun like you might expect. The planet and the sun orbit around each other. Um, and in fact, more specifically, they orbit around their center of mass. So uh, the center of mass can be thought of as kind of the balance point between two different objects. So for example, if I had two bocce balls, something like this, and I connected them, they're about the same mass, so you would expect that their center of mass would be directly in between them. Let's check it out. So here's my, they're both connected by a rod now. And if I balance, find the balance points right about in the center, right about here. And if these were two orbiting bodies, they would orbit around the center of mass, something like this. This is a good representation of uh, a binary star system, or two stars that are orbiting around each other in their, their center of mass. But what if one of the objects was uh, significantly smaller? So for example, this sized. Well, you'd expect that the center of mass or the balance point would be kind of shifted more towards the more massive object. So instead of being at the center, suddenly we need to move it a little bit closer, right about there, to the more massive object. And now in this case, the orbit would look something like this. So in a, in a typical solar system, this is a great depiction, my, my daughter painted this, 
I'm very proud of it. Uh, th this is the sun at the center and a, a planet at the outskirts. And in a typical solar system, the, uh, the sun accounts for most of the mass in a solar system. Uh, so you can imagine that that balance point between the two objects would be greatly shifted. So if I tried to find like, the balance point between these two objects, uh, it's going to fall towards the sun pretty happily. I have to get really close, really up on the sun, before I can find that balance point, that center of mass between the sun and the planet. So um, let's check out the orbit of this sun-planet system around the center of mass. I want you to notice the, the planet itself is doing its normal circle around the sun as you'd expect, but you'll notice that the sun here is also doing a very small circle around the center of mass as well. It's doing a tiny little wiggle dance around that center of mass. And believe it or not, that little wiggle is the key to finding exoplanets. You'll notice that in this motion, the sun and the planet are in lockstep with each other, orbiting around. So if we can discover the wiggle of our sun, uh, of the sun we're looking at, then we can discover the planet that's causing it to do that wiggle. So let's start with uh, our solar system. Now, the solar systems can be any configuration, as far as I'm concerned. They can be any orientation with respect to us. So let's start with a solar system that is uh, face on, which means that it's looking directly at us. You can see the planets like uh, at a face. In this case, the uh, solar system is going to be wiggling around in the sky. So this is, let's think about, this is the, the object we're looking at and all of the stars that are in the background are mostly stationary. If we were to watch this star as it wiggled around the center of mass, uh, we would be able to watch it move in the sky with respect to all the other stars. So, um, yes, thank you. So for example, if you were an astronomer hanging out on TRAPPIST-1, that star I was talking about that was about 40 light years away, uh, and you were watching our sun, well, you would notice, there we go, uh, you would notice that our sun was wiggling ever so slightly in its, in, its, uh, in its center of mass. If you looked at it, you would see uh, this little spiral pattern as it progresses through decades. You can, you can look at the path of our sun in this uh, diagram here, you can see that through the decades, it has changed its position as it wiggles around in the sky based on all the other planets that are orbiting around it. And in fact, if you were a, an amazing astronomer on TRAPPIST-1 and had a really good telescope and knew the math, you could actually figure out the mass of all of our planets and how far away they were from our sun based entirely on the tiny wiggles in the sky of our sun. Uh, but we aren't on TRAPPIST-1, we are here uh, on Earth, and we can use this technique to discover uh, planets around other stars. So uh, here's an example of a star field. You can see this is Ursa Major, or the Big Dipper. Uh, you can see the Big Dipper in the constellation map on the left there, it's at the top. If you find the Big Dipper and you kind of go down from there, one of those stars is called 47 Ursa Major, and that star uh, we've been watching uh, through a few years, and we can watch it wiggle in the sky ever so slightly. In fact, the, the right side there, you see the map of the star as it's moved around its center of mass. And by mapping that motion of that star, we can determine the planets that are orbiting around. In fact, there's a few planets orbiting around that star. And we can find their size and their distance from their star and other interesting neat parameters about that. All right, so that's one, that's for a face-on system. What happens if suddenly our system is edge-on, like this? Well, suddenly there's a lot less wiggle in the sky, I'll say. Uh, you're not going to see it wiggling in big circles anymore. It's just kind of dancing back and forth. Uh, and, and that's an issue, so, but we have a technique for this. It's called the Doppler shift technique. Um, and it uses the idea of Doppler shift of light in order to be able to figure out that wiggle that is so important. Um, now let me start, this might sound a little bit scary, but Doppler shift is something that you've heard in your lifetime, I promise you this. If you've ever heard an ambulance uh, coming past you, or, or maybe a race car, if you've ever watched a race car, you hear that sound of vroom as it buzzes past the camera, that is an example of Doppler shift. As something that's producing sound is coming towards you, those waves get squished, and that squish produces a higher pitch, a higher frequency. 
as something is traveling away from you, those waves get expanded and uh, they produce a lower frequency or a lower pitch. So that's where that sound that it's higher and then suddenly lower, it goes vroom, very quickly across. Let me show you an example of this. I've got a uh, sound generator. It's just a sine wave generator. It's going to sound like this. You ready? Okay. It's not very pleasant, but it's going to produce the same frequency of sound uh, continuously. And what I'm going to do is that I'm going to make it orbit around me. And uh, as I do that, I want you to listen to the sound that it produces. You ready? Here we go. Here we go. Did you hear it? Did you hear the wobble? Notice that as it was coming towards you, it was producing a higher frequency, a higher pitch. And as it was traveling away from you, it was producing a lower pitch. I want to do it one more time, just so you can hear it. All right, here we go. Listen for the pitch to change. Coming towards you. There we go. Towards you is higher. Away from you is lower pitched. That is the Doppler effect. And that is the Doppler effect specifically for sound. Sound is a wave and it has this Doppler effect. Light is also a wave. And therefore we'd expect it to have a Doppler shift as well. But with sound, the frequency is related to the pitch, how high or low the pitch is. With light, frequency is related to color. So um, let me move forward one here. Yeah, so uh, a, a, a higher frequency light tends to be bluer, and lower frequency light tends to be redder. Uh, and so as in this example, a light bulb is careening towards one person and moving away from the other person. The person on the left, uh, this yellow light bulb, is, uh, its wave is getting compressed, and therefore its light is producing a bluer tint, whereas the uh, person that the, that the light bulb is moving away from, the waves are expanding outwards, and it's producing a redder pitch. Now, this light bulb is a little bit uh, extraordinary and moving extraordinarily fast to produce this effect. But it's effect and it's measurable in light. And I want you to think about our orbiting uh, sound machine, but now instead we're going to be talking about an orbiting star. So let's go back to our star that's edge on. And you'll notice that in this motion, there's times where it's moving towards you and it's times that there's moving away from you. In fact, here's a great example of this. Um, you can see we're looking from the edge of this planet. And you're seeing times when that star is moving away from us and that star is moving towards us. And during those times, the Doppler shift is very much in effect. As it's coming towards us, it's getting squished and ending up a little bit more blue. And as it's moving away from us, it's getting expanded and ending up a little bit more red. And we can watch these regular patterns of the star as it wiggles in its orbit to determine the parameters of the planet that it's orbiting around. That is the Doppler shift of a star. And that is one more way that we can determine the exoplanet surrounding that star. There's one other technique I wanted to describe. What happens now if instead of, uh, instead of being mostly edge on like this, the planet was perfectly edge on such that the planet got in the way of the sun and in fact got in front of that sun. This is something that's called a transit. Let me show you an example of it. This is the transit of Mercury. I hope you can see that tiny dot that's going in front of that giant sun. I told you that Mercury was tiny. <laughs> that tiny dot is, is Mercury passing in front of our sun and causing the amount of light that you're seeing from that sun to go down ever so slightly. Now, when we're looking at exoplanets and, or, or uh, suns, I should say, that are distant, we're not going to be able to see that dot exactly, but we will be able to see uh, the amount of light from that star decrease ever so slightly. So let me show you an example of this. Uh, a, a sun normally, or sorry, a star normally has a flat, regular amount of light that it produces. Only when something kind of gets in the way or gets in front of it, or uh, do you see this dip in the amount of light that the star produces? So you can see this transit happening of an exoplanet going in front of its star and the dip that it's causing in brightness over time. This is called the transit technique. And it's actually one of the most powerful techniques uh, for finding exoplanets. Uh, in fact, uh, it's so powerful that there is an, uh, a satellite right now. This is the thing I mentioned at the beginning. It's called the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, or TESS. 
Uh, it's a space satellite. And what it does is that it, it takes long, uh, long sets of pictures of large patches of the sky. It's got a wide angle lens. And it takes 27 days worth of pictures of this star field and looks for tiny little dips that might occur in that star field. Now, because it's got a wide field camera, you can imagine that the pixels of this camera are, are quite big. So all it can do at best is say, hey, here's some targets of interest. Here's dips that we're seeing in the sky. Now we need help to figure out if those dips are important. So this is where we come in. Uh, this is, our, this is my baby. This is my telescope. Uh, it, this is the Peters Observatory Telescope. It's just a 12-inch Mead telescope. And we use it to take regular pictures and do follow-up pictures of the test. The test finds these interesting targets. And we uh, watch them from ground-based observatories, like, like the Peters, Peters Observatory. And we create light curves where we look for the depth, uh, the, the, the dip in the amount of light to change as a planet goes in front of that star. In fact, this is uh, on the left. You're seeing data from a student of mine uh, who who found a uh, potential uh, exoplanet, possibly, uh, and so we we submit this data to this NASA group and they uh, this MIT group and, and they uh, process the data and confirm or deny whether they think this is an exoplanet and create more follow-ups uh, in the future. Um, so. To this day, astronomers have detected thousands and thousands of exoplanets. Uh, we, using this technique, we've been able to discover all sorts of different varieties of different sizes and uh, configurations of solar systems. Uh, and I wanted to give you a quick tour of some of the, uh, the, the better ones that we found. This is actually a, a set of uh, posters from, there's a NASA website that, that has all of these posters on it. Um, and this is artist depictions of some of these solar systems. This is a Kepler 16b, and it is an exoplanet that is orbiting around a binary star system. Its nickname is Tatooine. I wonder if you know why. <laughs> if, uh, in, in its uh, orbit, you would have two shadows because you have two suns in the sky. Next, we have uh, 30, uh, 55 can Cancer E. Uh, which is considered to be a lava planet in a sense because it's an Earth-like rocky planet, but it's so close to its uh, star, and the star is so hot that uh, solid rocks just cannot exist. It, uh, all of the rocks on that planet would be in a liquid lava ball. <laughs> so this is a lava planet that we've discovered. Next, uh, Trappist-1. Trappist uh, this, this is our old friend that we were talking about earlier, 40 light years away. It is actually a multi-planet system. In fact, all the planets are so crowded and stacked up on each other that they look like, well, the, like as they're depicted in this poster, uh, like a bunch of moons that are all kind of crowded and stacked on each other like this. And last but not least, Kepler-186f. This is an Earth-like planet that is habitable. We have found habitable planets in other solar systems. And this is an example of one of them, uh, which you know, sparks the idea of, of the possibility of life existing. I'm not going to say that that's an actual representation of what Kepler looks like, but the idea that the possibility of life is out there, there are planets just like Earth, it's very exciting. Now, these are just artist renditions of what we think these planets could look like. But it begs the question, couldn't we just take a picture of these planets? If we know they're out there, we know where they are, couldn't we just take a photo? Now, you have to go back to that uh, firefly buzzing around, or the, the fly buzzing around the lighthouse issue, because you'd imagine that it's incredibly difficult to actually take pictures of these planets. But, again, clever astronomers have been able to figure out a way. If you block out the light from the sun of that solar system, and you have a nice, close-by, face-on system, well, suddenly, you can actually take pictures photos of exoplanets. This is an example of, uh, of, of a star that's in Pegasus. If you know where the Pegasus constellation is, this is just one of those stars. If you take a picture of it and block out the light from the sun, you can see tiny little dots, you can see them floating around to the right here, that are orbiting around the star. This is a little gif of a collection of pictures of these little dots of exoplanets that are orbiting slowly 
around their star. And because we can figure out their orbits, we can figure out their mass, their distance away, and, and kind of what to expect from the planet that are there. This is HR uh, 8799. This is an awesome, uh, that we can actually just take pictures of this stuff. It's something that I would have never guessed that was possible, except for that I've seen it myself. Um, another question that comes up is, can't we just go visit them? And uh, well, it's, it's tough, I'll say. Unfortunately, our, our current technology is, is rockets. That's how we navigate space which is basically just a, a big seat that you expel gas from one end of it and it propels you forward. And uh, rockets uh, are not, a, not very good at getting places. In fact, if we go back to our scale here of our solar system, a one in a billion scale with the, uh, with the sun being our beach ball, uh, our best technology, our current rockets on this scale travel at about one foot every hour. So can you imagine trying to f go foot by foot, hour by hour, incredibly slowly across our solar system? That's why it takes months to get places like, uh, like Mars, for example. If we were to try to go to TRAPPIST-1, for example, and visit that collection of exoplanets, it would take, well, 100,000 years. That's many, many lifetimes. It'd have to be a generational ship. It would be uh, nearly impossible, I'll say. And um, well, rockets are tough. Rockets are an interesting thing. In fact, let me show you my rocket real fast. This is my uh, rocket. It's a tricycle, as it turns out. And I've uh, strapped a fire extinguisher to the back of it. And it's, uh, it is my rocket fuel. It's going to propel gas out the back. And it's going to exert, uh, push me forward. Now, there's more problems with rocket ships than just how long it takes to get places. Um, and I want you to see if you can figure out. But first, I got to get my safety gear on. I almost forgot. Here we go. I got my safety helmet. But first, let's get my safety cape on. <laughs> All right, cool. Got my cape. Got my helmet. All right. So my rocket. I'm going to blast off from the sun, and uh, safety's off. All right, three, two, one. See the problem? <laughs> awesome. So, two problems, actually. The first of which being, I have to take all my fuel with me everywhere I go. <laughs> I have to, st and the, more fur the further I wanna get, the faster I wanna go, I need more fuel. So it's kind of a, a, a destructive process of how to get places. The other thing is, I don't know if you noticed, but I almost crashed into the back wall. Uh, you actually need to stop when you get to the place where I, I thankfully have brakes on my tricycle. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's safe and I can stop when I want to. But think about it. If you're traveling at high speeds towards another star, uh, you need to stop. <laughs> and so you have to reserve half your fuel to get there and the other half just to slow down and stop uh, when you get there, and again, we're talking hundreds of thousands of years to get there, it's uh, excessive, let's say. I, I, and I'm sorry, to, to, I'm sorry, but it's unlikely that humans will, will ever really be able to visit other planets, in person anyway. We can still take our nice pictures. Um, so it's, to answer the question that I posed at the very beginning of this talk, exoplanets, where are they and how can we find them? Well, as it turns out, exoplanets are everywhere. We just need to know what to look and how to look for them. And in the fact, I've showed you a good few examples. And I hope that I've inspired some of you to join us astronomers in the search and the quest to find new worlds. Uh, thank you for your time, and I'd, I'd be happy to answer any questions. I'll get my cape off, too. I was a little concerned about the wall. <laughs> that means that I did the right thing. Yes. <laughs> now I know that I can make my own rocket ship. Yes. Like as well. It's very fun to ride, I will say as well. Uh, it really, it gets going very fast. <laughs> Do you ever let your students ride? <laughs> oh yeah. yeah. In fact, at the end of this process, I have to actually expel all the gas from the fire extinguisher. So mm -hmm. I just kind of give it to students and say, have some fun, go cruise around 
Uh, and it's actually, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> it's, a, it's a good time. I might have to make a visit up. <laughs> Absolutely, I would be happy to have you. All right, so we have one attendee with a question and I'm going to allow Sarah to talk. Sarah, if you're there, you have talking permissions. Nope. Okay, I'll come back to Sarah. How can, Linda Lark asks, how can I help look for planets? That was about to be my question, Linda. <laughs> oh yeah. So um, you need a modest sized telescope and you need some kind of camera that you can stick on the back of it to actually take photos. Those are the two basic requirements. Um, and so once you have these things and you feel like you can track the sky reasonably, a good mount is also very helpful to point your telescope. Um, and if you can track the stars in the sky reasonably closely, then uh, you would join, uh, you would, you would uh, submit an application to join the SG-1 group, which is one of the, the, the groups of tests. There's a lot of different layers to this, this test group that I've kind of been sweeping under the rug. But the test group, the idea is, is that they give you targets that they think are interesting, that they've seen dips in, and then you do follow-up observations from your observatory. And so if you get your uh, camera and your telescope pointed correctly at the star that they give you, you can watch and create that, that uh, light curve that I showed you. And uh, you would submit that data back to the major group and then they would, they would do their own follow-ups and, and checks and eventually uh, that could be confirmed as a new exoplanet. Amazing, is there a base telescope that you would recommend for this? Well, okay, so I, I know that people have done it with a 10-inch telescope. Uh, the 10 inch, what I mean by that is the, the barrel, the width of the telescope is about 10 inches wide. They were also in the deserts of Colorado, though, uh, so, or somewhere around the West deserts. So they, they didn't have any worries about uh, you know, air, uh, light pollution or air issues. Uh, I myself use a 12-inch telescope, uh, and that does the job most of the time. We are running into issues where I can't quite see the darkest of things anymore. But, uh, but generally speaking, uh, that's as much as you need. You don't need a, a $100,000 uh, giant telescope in order to really be able to do this work. This is meant for ground-based observatories to help NASA and, and MIT uh, follow up on these interesting targets. They need to crowdsource this, let's say. Sarah Ward asks, can you talk about some of the planets that you have found? Okay, so again, I am doing follow-up observations. So I have not personally been, I've not personally found a planet. I have been a part of the pipeline in the process that finds planets. So for example, um, gosh, the, the one that I showed data of a little while ago, um, that was a planet that we think, if we fit the curve reasonably, uh, was a Jupiter-sized planet that was orbiting very close to its, uh, its host star. It's called the hot Jupiter is what it's called. Um, and, it's, and we know that because it was orbiting regularly uh, and it was causing a reasonably large dip in the light curve. Uh, and so we could, we could do some math and fit these equations in order to figure out what is an estimate, what is an estimate for the size and the scope of this planet. And so then, you know, we, we take this data and then we pass it on to uh, Karen Collins is her name in SG-1. And she's the one that kind of vets all the data and makes sure that it's all reasonable and then collects that data. And if there's more follow-up observations that are needed, uh, if something is weird or if something's off, then we'll send it back into the pipeline. Or if things are reasonable, then she'll send it up and maybe we'll get Doppler shift information on it or, or some other uh, follow-ups where we can look at the, um, at, at the motions of, of the star, that kind of stuff. Uh, and then eventually someone will write this up into a paper with a hundred names at the end of it because it takes that much people <laughs> to, to, to be a part of this exoplanet and it will say this is a confirmed exoplanet after it's gone through the whole process. I guess my follow-up question to that, you said that you get funneled some of the planets to assist with. Has the department ever come back to you with any findings that have been confirmed? Down I've only been doing this for, a, yeah, so sorry, I, I've been doing this for a few years. So the answer so far is no. <laughs> I've done a, a range of theses on this. Uh, a lot of my students get to do this. I've got summer students doing research with me right now. I've got uh, small research students that are, that are coming with me that are seniors. 
Uh, and so far, we've been adding our data to the pipeline, and nothing's come back yet. I'm gotcha. hoping it will. And would you okay. say, on average, it takes a few years for this data to be reduced and to come back? I noticed in the GIF that you compiled over time that the work began, correct me if I'm wrong, in 2000. It was like over a nine year period. It ended in oh, yeah. 2016 and in 2009. Absolutely. So think about the orbit of a planet. It takes mm -hmm. our Earth a year to go around the sun. So if we were being watched by some uh, distant telescope, they'd have to wait a year for another chance for this thing to go around. Mm -hmm. And so TESS is taking 27 days worth of data uh, and trying to look for these dips to try to find targets of interest and see if there's any regularities to them. Uh, and so the things that we tend to find are the things that have regular orbits around their star. Uh, so like orbits as short as three days where it takes three days for this planet to go all the way around their sun, which means that they're probably very close to their sun, uh, and they're also probably very big <laughs> uh, in order to really be seen. It's those, rare, uh, it's those rare planets that have longer periods that are the really interesting ones. And those are the ones that every now and then when those come up, I'll get an email saying, hey, target of interest, everyone that can look at this thing, because I don't know how long it's going to be before we see it again kind of thing. Right. Um, <laughs> And of course, this is upstate New York, so we have to contend with the sky most of the time. Uh, honestly, the way that we do the research, because the, the clouds are quite never, never quite with us, is we find a clear night first, mm -hmm. <laughs> and then we look at the potential targets of interest and find one that we can reliably do. And then we take the data set, and it becomes a thesis. It reminds me a little bit of Nantucket in the sense that we have really great dark skies, but weather yeah. often becomes our constraint. <laughs> yeah. Like, we were supposed to have a stargazing night last night and we had a random thunderstorm, even though there it was like 18%, but at the start time, just completely began thunderstorming. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> I got that cancellation message. <laughs> it was, I felt bad, but I also understand. Mm -hmm. People ask yeah, me if I have regular, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 you go ahead, please. I was just gonna say, people ask me if I have regular hours at my observatory. I'm like, no, <laughs> I can't predict the weather for a few days out. Like, I, I, when I have a clear night, that's when we do nice fun stargazes for the community. Sorry, your question. Right. No worries. Emmy asks, what is the process for determining if a candidate exoplanet is in fact a planet? Are there specific set qual qualifications? Yeah, so um, really what we're trying to do is trying to get rid of false positives in this pipeline. So uh, there's a couple different ways that we can use this light curve information to try to determine if it's an exoplanet or, or a false positive. Now, a false positive is typically uh, that, that binary star system that I was telling you about, where you've got two, uh, well, I can get my little diagram. Let me, let me show you. This is my uh, binary star system right here. So. Uh, this is two stars that are orbiting around each other like this, and if they're doing it perfectly in line with each other, then uh, they'll block the light out from one another and cause those same dips that you would expect to see in a light curve, but because there's two suns and uh, not a planet. And so actually, there's a couple different ways we can do this. We can look at the shape of the light curve. We can look at uh, the colors. So if you looked at this in, in the color blue, we have filters that filter out certain colors of light and let some through. So if we looked at and let all the blue light through, as the red star got in front, the blue light would disappear. And as the uh, blue star got in front, the uh, red light would disappear. And uh, that shouldn't happen if it's a planet. If it's a planet, it should just go dark consistently across all the different colors. So we can look at different colors to try to determine if it's a false positive. Uh, we can look at the, the depth or the shape of the curve. Uh, but again, we're not really the ones doing the final calls on this stuff. We're the ones uh, doing the ground-based observing. We're doing astronomy like you envision astronomy works, where uh, you're out at a telescope late at night, seeing the early morning skies, uh, and, and taking data after data and processing that data. Um, but we end up submitting this data to uh, the greater test group, and they're the ones that make the final calls. We just collect the data, let's say. Can you talk more about what the difference in the shape of the curve might be for a false positive? Sure. So um, I'm going to have to draw on the board if that's OK. Looks like you can see me OK. So a, uh, a nice normal, for a planet that's going in front, you can imagine the planet's probably significantly smaller than the star itself. This is the star. Um, as it goes in front of 
the star, it's going to cause a small amount of dip in the amount of light. So you'd imagine if this is the normal amount of light that the star produces, it's going to dip into a, into a, a certain a valley. And then as it goes across the star, it's going to have that same amount of light loss throughout. And then eventually it's going to leave the star and it's going to come back up and it's going to be back to its flat normal self. So you can imagine that this little like plateau or this valley, I should say, uh, it should be reasonably flat if we're looking for a, a planet to cross in front. Now, if we had a giant star, for example, uh, let's, let's crossing in front, something like, ah, oh, that's too big, too big. Something like this, let's say. Now that star is going to cross in front eventually, and it's going to leave pretty much right after that and be gone. So the light curve might look more like a, a V shape with a, with a deeper curve and uh, no, no flat zone in the bottom, no, no flat valley in the bottom like our planet. So this is a star crossing in front of another star. You're going to see more of a V shape. And also, if we look at colors, we're going to see different depths at different colors. So that's a good way to disentangle star versus planet. Amazing. Thank you for that. That leads me into Sarah's question. When will yes. we see visible spectrum imaging of an exoplanet? When do we see clouds or oceans, potentially? Oh, yeah. So that's a great question. I think, um, I don't know. It's going to take a much bigger telescope than James Webb before we can actually resolve things like oceans or sky. But I will say that the James Webb Space Telescope is doing its first detection, like direct detection, of planets where it's looking at the light. You know, you can block out the sun from the star and you can look directly at the exoplanet. And because it can grab the light from that star, it can do what's called the spectra, where it looks at all the different elements of all the different things in the atmosphere. And it can figure out what kinds of things are in the atmosphere of that planet. Now, we can't just take a picture of what's in the atmosphere, but we can try to disentangle it using this little spectral code. And, and OK, so this is my hot take. I'm not going to uh, stand behind this for very long, but uh, and honestly, my, a lot of my astronomer friends disagree with me. But I think that in the next five to 10 years, we're going to see the first signs, first biosignatures, let's say, or signs of life on another planet. And the way that we're going to do that is we're going to be probing the atmosphere of these planets. And I, I'm, I mean, like taking pictures of the, the uh, I'm sorry, I'm still overselling it. What I mean is that we're going to be looking at the spectra of the direct observations of a planet. And we're going to find different elements that we don't expect to see in a planet that doesn't have life. Uh, and I think that's, that's a big drive for what's going on with the James Webb Space Telescope right now, is looking at the atmospheres of exoplanets and trying to disentangle what kinds of uh, gases are composed of that atmosphere. I love that you answered two questions all at the same time, because the follow-up <laughs> question was, what are astronomers learning about exoplanets with the James Webb Space Telescope? <laughs> yes. Uh, well, I mean, they're doing their first direct observations mm -hmm. of, of of exoplanets. And they look like dots. I mean, don't get me wrong. You're not going to be able to resolve uh, <laughs> like skies or, or land masses or anything like that. Again, these things are ridiculously far away. It's hard to express how far away these things are, and our minds are just not built to think about these distances. But um, yeah, the best that we get are these tiny little dots next to stars. And that is enough to learn a lot about these uh, planets. It does make me, you know, feel a little slighted for all of the not to scale solar system <laughs> images and models I've seen my entire educational career. I feel a little slighted. <laughs> well, I mean, don't. It feel, it's impossible to get this right. correct. I mean, there's just no way to depict it on a reasonable scale. Right. It is hard to conceptualize. No, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> How long have you worked in astronomy from an anonymous attendee? Oh, I, uh, I, I have been doing astronomy uh, since undergraduate. I was in charge of the planetarium at Bowling Green State University. I was in charge of stargazes. I'd bring students up and show them the sky, show them Saturn. Saturn's amazing, by the way. If you've never seen it, check it out in a telescope. It's like every picture you've ever seen in a, in a textbook. Um, so anyhow, yeah, in undergrad, I was big into astronomy. Uh, I, I went to grad school. Uh, and I did physics education research, and I did astronomy. And uh, I, I ended up doing a PhD in 
physics, but with physics education as my research. Uh, because one of, the, one of the dirty secrets of astronomy is that uh, it's not really spending time at a telescope like you think it is. It's 99% uh, it's, it's coding. <laughs> so you spend a lot of time at a computer coding and typing. You've got data sets, you're, you're coding and compiling them and finding results. And uh, that wasn't for me. I wanted to be out at the telescope. I wanted to be watching things and looking at things. Uh, and so I ended up doing physics education research. And uh, since I got a job at Hamilton here, I've uh, been in charge of the observatory. And I've been kind of recouping it, building it up again, getting it equipped so that we could do this research. And it's just for the fun of it. I love it. Uh, it's something that I feel like I'm really contributing to finding new worlds. And uh, I love that I've had all this astronomy training pre prior that has been kind of getting me ready to do this kind of this fun stuff as far as I'm concerned. Thank you for sharing that. What is your favorite planet? If you um, have one. <laughs> probably Earth. <laughs> That's a cheeky answer. Uh, I mean, to look at in the sky, I, I would give my favorite planet Saturn for sure. Uh, again, you got to look at that through a telescope. Jupiter's amazing as well. Uh, yes. Favorite planet, though, to look at on a telescope is definitely Saturn. What's the best part about looking at Saturn? The rings or that the oh. fact that it looks pretty much as every image you've seen? <laughs> well, I mean, the rings are, are what you're expecting to see when you look at Saturn. So when you look at Saturn, you see exactly what you expect to see, which is a ring, a, sur a circle surrounded by a ring. And it's just, it looks uh, perfect in every way. People accuse me of putting a sticker on the eyepiece of the telescope because it's just so beautiful, so perfect. I don't know. No, it is. I agree. It, I remember the first time I saw Saturn, I was just like blown away that something so far away can be depicted so clearly to yeah. oversimplify it. It really is a perfect image in the sky. Yeah. <laughs> One, two more questions. If the universe is expanding, what is it expanding into? Oh, gosh. That's a big question. Mm -hmm. um, I, the answer that I can think to give in this moment is that it's, the universe is everything. It's infinite. So if it's expanding, uh, it's not that it's expanding into something. It just is the thing that's expanding. Uh, so I'm trying to think of a good way to describe this. Uh, the universe is everything. So if it's expanding, then the everything is getting bigger. And I. Dang, that's a really tough question. <laughs> uh, but the universe is everything, so it should be expanding uh, into itself, in a sense, or expanding. It, space itself is getting bigger, so therefore it's not like it's expanding into anything. It's just getting bigger just by default. I don't know. That's not a very good answer, if I'm being honest, but that's the best one I can come up with right now. I like to think of it as it's taking up space. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, absolutely. Can elongated orbits still be in the Goldilocks zone? Um, that, that's another great question. Uh, I think the answer is uh, sometimes yes. But so, so just to explain, the Goldilocks zone is this space between uh, being too close to a planet, in which uh, being too close to the sun, I should say, where everything's too hot, all the water boils off and escapes the solar system, uh, or being too far away and your water turns into ice. The Goldilocks zone is this is this magical zone in a solar system, where uh, the water is is water. It's liquid water, and we think that water is probably the most important part of life existing. So that's why we're looking for places that have liquid water on the surface. Uh, now the question was, if you have an, an elongated, I think we mean elliptical orbit, where it's getting closer and further away from the 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 sun can you still have liquid water? Can you be in the Goldilocks zone? And the answer is that uh, maybe depending on the orbit. If the orbit goes uh, too close to the star, then you will suddenly uh, not be in the Goldilocks zone and eventually your water will boil away and uh, not be part of your, your planet anymore. If you get too far away, uh, there is a chance that you could have ice water for a little while and liquid water for another extended period of time. But uh, I, I see that as... Un that's something that, that I think transcends the Goldilocks zone, in my opinion. So I think that we're really looking for planets that are in that zone for most of their, their circular-ish orbits. Awesome. What is your most favorite concept to teach in your classes? Oh, man. Oh, that's a tough one. 
Because <laughs> I, 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 I like. <laughs> what's that? You can have a top five if you'd like. Uh, well, so, so no the problem is I, I, I love teaching astronomy, if you couldn't tell. Uh, <laughs> it's something that I think that it, it's, it's such an existential, but uh, such a big topic that it's something that I think on day one, I just show the size and scale, kind of like the way that I did it just now, where we talk mm -hmm. about the beach balls and how far away things are. And then you do the big zoom out on day one, where you start at the, the Earth and then you just keep zooming out from there and you see uh, kind of the, the solar system unfolding and then the galaxy unfolding and then all the galaxies that are out there. And you realize that you're one, one star, you're, you're one star in a hundred billion stars in your galaxy. And then there's hundreds of billions of galaxies and you're just one planet hanging out around that star. Like that's, uh, that's to me important that people know that and it's mind blowing. And oftentimes I have to take about a five minute break after we do that video <laughs> because it's, uh, Everyone's kind of going through their own little existential crisis at that moment. <laughs> and I give them a chance to kind of unpack all this information and think about uh, kind of how small we are uh, with respect to everything. Kind of makes all the, uh, all the things in your life seem very, very tiny compared to the size Definitely. of the universe. I would agree. I'd say that's my favorite topic to get into because I, I think that if you're not causing students to have existential dilemmas, then you're not teaching astronomy right. <laughs> Fair enough. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, how can us or we amateur astronomers help with locating exoplanets? Like here on Nantucket, I do have access to an observatory and I'm lucky, but is there anything that anyone truly in their backyard can be doing to help locate exoplanets? So you do need a little bit of technology to, to aid you. You need a telescope, you need the mount that's going to point your telescope reasonably. Um, mm -hmm. And you need a camera that can that can do reasonable work. Um, it's 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 there is a learning curve, I will say, as I have gone through it myself, of how the technology works and how to point things correctly, how to get all the data to compile correctly. You have to, you have to learn about this process. Uh, it, there's there's all this the calibration images and things like that. But the good news is that if you're really interested in doing this and feel like you have some capital to put into like buying a, a camera, for example. It's about a thousand dollars. There is a course from the uh, AAVSO, the American Association of Variable Star Observers, uh, and Dennis Conti, who is the guru of all exoplanet things, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, he's created a guide. He's created a course, and uh, you can take this course. It's about a four-week course on how to observe exoplanets. And if you have the the technology and you have the know-how through this course. You can actually get involved in the SG-1 even as an amateur astronomer. You can get involved in this SG-1 group and uh, get part of the, the, pipe, the data pipeline that, that feeds into this uh, MIT-led NASA group. That is amazing. I think that it would be so wonderful to expose, especially high school age students who aren't e not really thinking yet about what their future careers or their future interests, but I think with the right training, with the right leadership, or someone to guide them, this would be an excellent project, especially yeah. for kids on Nantucket. I'm just thinking of a... Like, yeah, this is a very accessible project, I'll say. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I have thought about reaching out to high school students. Um, unfortunately, time is my limitation, but... Uh, Definitely. <laughs> it's something that a high school student could do if trained properly. Well, I think there's opportunity for a collaboration there. I have a couple of kids presently, former students of mine that are interested in going on to potentially study astronomy. So oh, nice. any guidance you can provide, I'm sure they would be grateful. <laughs> I would be happy to help. Are there any questions from our attendees left? If there are, you can go ahead and type them in the Q&A. You can raise your hands and I will give you speaking permissions. But as we wait to see if any other questions come up, what advice would you give to amateur astronomers, future students, with regard to how we can continue to contribute to just exploring what lies beyond our planetary bounds? Well, the, the pipeline I described, I think, would be the, uh, if you're really just wanting to be an amateur astronomer and help, uh, I would say that the pipeline I'm describing about uh, joining AAVSO 
and, and taking these exoplanet courses, it really gives you everything you need to know in order to be able to do this, this data taking. In fact, a lot of the SG-1 people are amateur astronomers, not professional astronomers with telescopes and observatories. It's just uh, some people that know how to use a telescope and are interested. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that you can very quickly learn, like in a four week course, uh, how, how to take these, these photos. And I think that would be a really uh, amazing way to contribute. The other thing I'm gonna mention is outreach. I think that's such an important piece that gets neglected. If you are an amateur astronomer or somebody that's an enthusiast or even an astronomer at a college, I would say uh, reaching out to people is one of the best things that you can do in astronomy because it's something that's so accessible to people. People want to know about it. They want to learn about it. Uh, and, and finding those people and getting them connected to telescopes, seeing the sky, uh, that is an amazing way that you can uh, support astronomy as a whole. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Any parting words for our audience this evening? Um, no, just thank you for all the great questions and thank you for attending. I appreciate uh, everyone. Well, we are so very lucky, fortunate, and grateful for your time and your work that you've done to prepare a presentation for us this evening. On behalf of the entire Mariah Mitchell Association, we just want to express our deepest, sincerest gratitude to you, Dr. Lark, for Thank taking you. the time again to share all that you know and your expertise with us. It's been such a pleasure. With that, I will conclude our Science Speaker Series. Again, I'm John Gurley, Director of Science and Programs at Mariah Mitchell Association. And huge thanks to Cisco Brewers, White Elephants, Hotels and Resorts, and our lead sponsor, Bank of America, for making our complimentary speaker series accessible to all. So much gratitude. <laughs>